Hi guys, it is a hot, sticky, miserable, 90 something degree April day here in the hell hole of South Austin, Texas. We have made it to Monday, April 28th, 2014 without dying of heat stroke. <coughs> I've been out scrounging around in the in the end times and the salvage economy I'm just now getting to you it's almost five o'clock in the afternoon time for me to be finally bringing you my what I used to call my economic meltdown roundup rant which is now my healthy economy sick planet rant where I just get right to the point trying to counteract some of the unadulterated horseshit on the mainstream media's financial pages as I look at just open and shut examples of the downside of the global industrial economy which is the fact that it is killing us and the planet. Just a small downside to all of the all of the blue skies in the economic news and I've mentioned some of these stories as the choppers bear down on me uh, <coughs> I'm gonna put the links let's let this chopper get on by we're gonna start out <coughs> start out with the story I've already talked about we're gonna start out with some good news I guess you can call this good news from right here in the state of Texas where we find this story from some group calling itself the Inquisitor, whatever that means. <coughs> Family wins three million dollars in groundbreaking fracking lawsuit. <coughs> I think <coughs> I must be too close to a fracking site, uh, judging by my own health. Okay. A Texas family was awarded nearly $3 million for damages to their health caused by a fracking operation near their home. The precedent-setting verdict against a fracking company is a massive win for fracking opponents and is the first fracking related lawsuit award given by a jury which coincidentally enough came on Earth Day. This has been a rough month for public relations in the hydraulic fracturing industry as earlier this month geologist directly linked earthquakes in Ohio to the process of fracking shale for natural gas. And going back to the Texas lawsuit, let's hear a little bit about what this family, this is Lisa Parr talking to CNN News about what happened to her and her family. Quote, One night, our whole house was vibrating and shaking. This is during the night. We leased that property for our cattle, so I went over there to make sure our cattle weren't there, and when I went over there, my nose and throat started burning. And that was the night that Lisa figured out the fracking operation next to her land was toxic. Not long after that, she started breaking out in rashes. Her body is now scarred from pot marks. She has four lumps the size of ping pong balls on her neck. Anyway, this goes on and on. I'm sure there is a response from the Planet Eaters. That would be Aruba Petroleum in this case. Aruba Petroleum denies that fracking had 
anything to do with the Texas family's illnesses and may appeal the verdict. The gas company argued, and I have no doubt that this is true, the gas company argued that it met Texas state regulatory standards. I'm quite sure that uh, tumors the size of golf balls on your neck do meet the Texas state regulatory standards for fracking. And further said that there was no evidence that fracking harmed the family in any way. Quote from Aruba Frackers, quote, we contend the plaintiffs were neither harmed by the presence of our drilling operations nor was the value of their property diminished because of our natural gas development. There you go. You heard it all. So, from Texas, uh, it, th this isn't exactly a, 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 a ecology story so much. I just thought, uh, I, I don't know guys, you can draw your own uh, dots here from AP, from Texas to North Dakota. For North Dakota, drones a possible growth market. There you go. Forget the North Dakota energy boom. How about a drone boom? State and federal officials have big hopes for the growth of unmanned aircraft systems, and North Dakota has positioned itself well to take advantage of its unique attributes. A first of its kind academic program, an established military presence, a strong commitment from state and federal officials to find funding, and even the weather. There you go. So uh, North Dakota becoming a leader in America's drone movement. And uh, this Let's see. According to a report from the from the Drone uh, Association, drones have the potential to create more than 100,000 jobs and more than 80 billion dollars in economic growth between now and 2025. And uh, it, it talks about creating the 100,000 jobs, but. Uh, what does this say about the other end of that equation when it's talking about uh, drones being ramped up here for agriculture? I've mentioned uh, drones and robots. Talking about where do you think th that all of these drones, well not all of them, but a bunch of them are going to be heading they are going to be heading to these industrial scale big ag farms for uh, number one spraying pesticides all over these farms and starting in North Dakota. Jesus. Um, quote, whoever this is, professor from the Brookings Institution, quote, quote, drones have many applications such as crop spraying that don't raise privacy concerns at all. And North Dakota's Extension Service is examining how drones can be used to improve seed applications, fertilizer, and pesticides, which could potentially reduce costs 
and improve crop performance. Yeah, the way they're going to reduce cost is by reducing the number of employees, meaning human employees. There you go. Anyway, let's go from North Dakota just to the rest of the planet. I, this story coming, uh, I have no idea why, from Business Wire magazine. Goldman Environmental Prize honors six heroes of the environment. And, 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 and you can trust Business Wire to tell you this, that the 2014 recipients recognize grassroots environmental achievements stopping fracking dams palm oil development land grabs coal mining and toxic waste dumps and i have no doubt that Business Wire magazine knows all about all about those subjects because every one of them is uh, is good for the global economy. So what what does Business Wire? How are they spinning the story? Pretty straight ahead. The Goldman Environmental Foundation today announced the six recipients of the 2014 Goldman Environmental Prize, a group of fearless leaders working against all odds, against all odds, meaning against these giant multinational planet-eating corporations that support publications such as Business Wire to protect the environment and their communities. All right, so who are the winners? And I love it. Guess where the, uh, guess where the ceremony on Wednesday will be held for the winners of the, the, this Global Environmental Prize? A ceremony will be held at the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center in Washington, D.C. Okay, this year's winners are Ramesh Agrawal from India who organized villagers to demand their right to information about industrial development projects and succeeded in shutting down one of the largest proposed coal mines in his uh, town. I'll have more to say about this story in a minute. Here is Ruth Mestacare from good old Peru. She united the Asha Ninka people in a powerful campaign against large-scale hydroelectric dams threatening to uproot indigenous communities in Peru. Uh, I don't know whether she won that one or not. She might, she might have defeated one, but you better believe there's about 3,000 more to take their place. Here is Desmond Dassault from South Africa. He successfully worked to shut down a toxic waste dump to, that exposed residents to dangerous chemicals. Here is Suran Gazirian from Russia, an internationally recognized bat expert. Suran led multiple campaigns against exposing government corruption and, and, and illegal use of federally protected forest land as part of the Winter Olympics. I mentioned this, how uh, the, these federally protected wildlife preserves in Russia were bulldozed down. I think it was about 8,000 acres of federally protected Russian wildlife preserves turned into the Olympic Village. Okay, 
Rudy Putra from Indonesia, a biologist. Rudy is dismantling illegal palm oil plantations that are causing massive deforestation in northern Sumatra. I'm not sure how you de dismantle a palm oil plantation. And from the good old USA, we have Helen Slot. Okay, what is Helen up to? She helped towns across New York defend themselves from oil and gas companies by passing local bans against fracking. Uh, I guess we need Helen to move to Texas. And then, uh, I guess it was the LA Times centered in on this fellow from India. Environment prize goes to an Indian activist who battled coal mine plan. And so this is this guy in India going up against the coal miners. Yeah, right. Uh, this is that guy, Ramesh Agrawal. Okay. The award for Agrawal, who was shot by, uh, not killed, but was injured when he was attacked by these security guards, these henchmen for big coal, the award for Agrawal highlights the risks faced by Indian campaigners who have tried to challenge powerful business interests. The company that Agrawal opposed, Jindal Steel and Power, is one of the country's largest energy firms and is led by multi-billionaire Naveen Jindal, who also happens to be a member of parliament. And Arwell challenged Jindal's coal project after seeing the harmful effects of rapid industrialization in his state. India's surging economy has created a yawning demand for coal, the country's primary fossil fuel. New mines and power plants have overtaken vast tracts of forest and farmland transforming agrarian Chhattisgarh state into one of India's fastest growing states. Environmentalists say that the breakneck expansion has worsened air and water quality, pushed poor villagers off their land, and produced industrial runoff that threatens small farms. A recent Greenpeace report blamed pollution from India's coal power plants for 120,000 premature deaths and 20 million new cases of asthma each year. And activists such as this guy winning this prize complain that industrialists are cozy with government officials who rubber stamp massive new industrial projects without regard for the environment and public health costs. There you go. So from India, let's go Oh boy, what is going on over there? Uh, I don't even know where it's going on over there. From AP, Greenpeace ship to confront Russian Arctic tanker. Do, do they ever learn? Do these Greenpeace guys ever learn? Here we go again. Greenpeace International is sending out a ship to protest a tanker bringing the first oil ever produced at a new Russian 
offshore oil platform in the Arctic Circle to Rotterdam is where this one is headed. The environmental group said Monday it has sent the Rainbow Warrior 3 uh, to meet the sh tanker, which is chartered by Russia's state-controlled oil company Gazprom. Gee, uh, where have we uh, heard this story before? Greenpeace has fiercely opposed the production of oil in the Arctic, warning of the danger of oil spills in such unforgiving territory and of the worsening global warming caused by using fossil fuels. And they also criticized the French oil company Total, who are the ones purchasing the Russian oil. Okay, the, the, this Russian oil from the Arctic heading to, Nether to the Netherlands to be sold to the French oil company. Uh, you might remember the, the Total Oil Company because, uh, as I have reported right here, Total, uh, you know, talking about how concerned that they are about drilling in the Arctic had ruled out drilling in the Arctic due to fears of spills. So instead of drilling the oil up there, they let someone else drill the oil and then they just buy it from them. It's kind of like Chevron Oil Company to this day continuing to buy oil drilled in the Ecuadorian Amazon jungle. They just let the Chinese uh, oil drillers drill the oil in the Amazon jungle and they just buy it directly off the Chinese oil tankers. Do, do you see this guys? Uh, how, how this score is? Okay, and as long as we're talking about uh, the Chinese taking over the planet, I've mentioned this story already and uh, I needed, I wish I had paid attention to how deep I was. I, anyway, I could do a, a two hour rant on this one. Why is Jamaica selling out its environment to a blacklisted international conglomerate? And I've already mentioned this before uh, about, <clears throat> about Jamaica's secretive deal to let a Chinese energy company build a mega freighter seaport smack dab in the nation's single largest natural protected area. The planned port would occupy the Goat Islands in the heart of the Portland Bight protected area, which only last year the same government officials now selling it to China were partitioning UNESCO to designate it a global biosphere reserve. But now the lure of a one and a half billion dollar investment and a rumored 10,000 jobs has resulted in the deal with China Harbor Engineering Company, part of a conglomerate blacklisted by the World Bank under its fraud and corruption sanctioning policy. Good God Almighty. Let's see, the plan involves clear-cutting the mangrove forest on these islands, building up uh, work areas using dredge spoils from the surrounding waters, and constructing a coal-fired power plant 
to support the new industrial infrastructure. The port, including areas already currently designated as marine sanctuaries, would accommodate, quote, post Panamax sized ships. We're talking tankers up to 1,200 feet long with a 50 foot draft, which will soon be arriving to Jamaica from China via the newly expanded Panama Canal. The new port would compromise an area known for extensive seagrass beds, coral reefs, wetlands, and Jamaica's largest mangrove forest. The protected area is also home to the Jamaican iguana, a species that was believed extinct until its dramatic rediscovery in 1990, right in the middle of where this giant megaport is being built. And uh, I want to I want to finish this rant on this quote, but uh, I have to get back to it. Okay, this is uh, Rick Hudson, a herpetologist from good old Texas. Quote. Everything is for sale in Jamaica. They are committed to developing every inch of the, of the coastline for high-end hotels and resorts. There's going to be no natural environment left. Okay, and then uh, talking about the Chinese, uh, I don't even know who this Alfred Sangster is, he characterized the Chinese in Jamaica as, quote, the new colonialist in a country which has long memories of the legacies of colonialism. And then we have, uh, more and more people just talking about, they go in uh, just talking about the Chinese taking over the planet. Um, let's see. Uh, quote, we live on a small island and it is hard to believe anything universal is happening here, but it is this whole idea that we should have more consumption. We already don't know what to do with our waste. We know we're going to see sea level rise, yet we just keep on building more. And... What was this one? Uh, my favorite quote from Brian Wilson from the University of the West Indies. Quote, it sends a really poor message to the international conservation community. Y yeah, I bet it does. And I, I, I love this one. Summing up this rant and how many more quote any place you put a lot of Chinese workers around the world the wildlife suffers it's pretty clear there you go the bottom line anywhere you put a lot of Chinese workers, not just the wildlife, but everything else uh, in their path suffers as China goes right ahead from Jamaica to Ecuador to Africa to Canada, eating this planet with or without help from the rest of us. 
packing up the rest of the planet on their mega freighters and sending it back to China. But anyway, I need to wrap up this healthy economy, sick planet rant and think of something else to do, I guess, before I get ready for a picking party for this edition of the April 28th, 2014 Meltdown Roundup. Bye, guys.